As a party of the conservative left, social conservatism is of particular interest to the SDP. But what should social conservatives think? Uh, to help answer the question, I'm joined, I'm delighted to be joined today by the writer and author Ed West. Welcome. Thanks. Now, what I'd like to do uh, is to base the whole discussion on uh, a blog piece you had on your Substack last November. Right. Great piece, uh, which was called What Should Social Conservatives Believe? Right. Uh, now, you start the piece by painting a, a sort of bleak but realist picture. I think I mentioned Peter Hitchens in the... You did. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, get onto yeah. that here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, right. yes, you're really starting there. <laughs> so yeah, you, you start it off with this bleak, bleak sort of realist picture uh, where we find ourselves. Uh, nothing works properly. The country's crumbling. Um, crime is basically illegal. Healthcare and transport are in a dismal state and immigration is out of control. And you say, I find it hard to understand why anyone would vote Conservative again. Peter Hitchens was right all along. The Tory party needs to die. Now, I agree with both of those things. <laughs> uh, why do you think that? I mean, there are, two, there are two problems here. One is just, I think, in terms of competence, they've not done the... Um, even if you take an ideology, they're just not effective at running things. Nothing, mm. nothing, almost nothing apart from wherever. And Michael Gove has been effective. Mm. Um, but in most areas, things have got worse. Mm. Uh, and then there's the, the, the missed opportunities. You know, one of the pressing things I find is that you could, I mean, apart from, apart from Brexit, which is obviously it takes up a huge amount of time, you, know, you could go and have gone to a coma in 2010 and far up now, and mm. you would have no idea who had been in charge. Mm. I mean, you wouldn't have particularly guessed that the Tories had been in charge. Right. Everything they you know, stand for is on the retreat. The, sort of the, the corridors of government, the, you know, the people who run the civil service, the education system, um, the kind of cultural hierarchy is, is much more progressive than it was before. Mm. And I know this is, you know, there's only a certain amount the government can do, but um, they haven't, you know, exactly trying very hard. You know, when I look at some of their sort of small pushbacks about, um, against kind of progressive overreach have been, for example, you know, reducing the power that Stonewall had in schools. Mm. That, even that was really the work of sort of left-wing feminist women who mm. were proposed to it. That's the only kind of victory they've had mm. in social matters, and it wasn't even theirs. And I just think generally there's a sort of, you know, Labour went into a big crisis under Jeremy Corbyn, and it looked like you know, they were facing massive defeat. But the Labour, both sides of the Labour Party, strongly mm. believed in, mm. in what they stood for. They just had very different visions. And, yes. and obviously, as the left is, they're always fighting with each other. Yeah. I, I feel that amongst Conservatives, there is really, um, they just really don't, they don't believe in it. I mean, I, I know they have the sort of, they still believe in, in the economic um, vision yes. of Conservatives. We'll get on to that. Yeah, I mean, whether, whether that's Conservative or whether it's sort of Liberal. Is yeah. another thing, um, and even that side. I mean, I know you know you're probably you know, much more pro Brexit than I am. I mean, even that under mm. whether Brexit is entirely or mostly or partly responsible for the economic downturn we're facing, mm. they've they've lost their reputation even for economic management. So they're, oh, they're totally, yeah. You know, they've got no unique selling point. I mean, mm. there'd be no reason to keep it yeah. going. So um, if well, you don't sort of have any victories on the social front and you don't have any victories on the economic front, and that's kind of zero. Out yeah, you're in I mean, a bit of trouble. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, yeah. so people might put up with one, <coughs> but, you know, I don't think well, I'm rubbish at both. I'll take your point about competence straight away, because I think you only have to look at the individuals involved. And I, I speak to uh, people in, in, in both major parties, and I can tell you it doesn't look very good. A lot of them really have no idea what's going on. Uh, but to get back to this point about, I mean, there's one thing, believing something and not getting it. Yeah. Uh, but my problem is that most of them don't believe in anything, and I think you, you sort of hint at that. And I would say with the Tories, the ones that do, there's not much ideology in the party, but the ideology that's in the party is wrong. Right. I mean, particularly the so free, free trade yeah. maniacs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ones that are ideological, you know, I mean, it's not um, Douglas Carswell anymore, but, you know, the sort of Dan Hannans and yeah. the free traders, they're, they're, they, they believe that. I mean, these are the believers in the Tory party. But it's completely wrong. I mean, that these. I mean, I'm, you know, right. I'm uh, probably more pro-liberal than you are on, you know, on mm. probably both fronts. But I, um, I think that there's nothing wrong with with having that strand of it. Mm. I just don't think there's anything else. I mean, the Conservatives were alliance. They were alliance between you know, liberals and yes. Conservatives. And yes. 
So Boris Johnson's most popular prime minister and most effective at winning elections, yes. and he was definitely, you know, liberal, uh, certainly liberal, or socially liberal, most, economically, yes, he was and, liberal. and personally. He's personally liberal. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and so th that's not a problem if you have other people and you're mm. effective. But unfortunately, mm. under him, everything was completely chaotic. Yeah, and and they basically blew their chances just by just pointless lies. Yeah, just pointless incompetence. Yeah, completely. Um, yeah, and we, yeah, I totally agree with you on the Brexit uh, vision. The, the only vision they had was unilateral free trade. Which is an insane idea, I think. If you want to, you've got you. I, I I always think if you want to look at it really crudely, Britain has two fundamental causes of of our problems, which is problems to do with deindustrialization of various kinds. The Midlands and the North are wrecked. You know, the towns are wrecked, and then problems uh, downstream of um, of family breakdown. And but to go back to this point, if you if I do a survey, if I look at the individuals in the Tory in the Parliamentary Party. Uh, I really struggle to find fellow social conservatives, you know, apart from sort of Miriam Cates, you know, da Danny Kruger. There's not, not many of them, very few. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's probably true. I, I, I mean, if you look at, I mean, when census results came, came up, and this, uh, I think, this probably offended, upset a lot of people. When Sajid, you know, tweeted about that afterwards, I think it was, was it Nigel Farage or something about this, you know, huge change. He said, yeah. tweeted, so what? So what? And yeah. I just thought, if you don't actually believe in sort of in basic like demographic stability in the country, no. if you don't believe in, there should be a, a quite a strong link between generations. And it doesn't rule out immigration, but when you have that amount of change in London, where it's completely unrecognisable, mm. no, even they don't in care. my lifetime, and they just think, so what? And then you just think, you're just doing that because you, now you're going off to another job. And you're going to be part of the blob, and you want to be them to like you. And you know, then like the next day, he announced he wasn't standing as MP, and he will inevitably go into one of these jobs. And you just think, yeah, but I think it's. Yeah, I mean, you you go on to it. I mean, again, I hope everyone will read the piece. I'm sure they will read the piece. But you 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 talk about the political groupings, the clusterings that are the Tory Party, and the. Yeah. Now you know, historically, it's been a a, a group of liberals and conservatives against socialists. That was the sort of that was the boundary. But I think the, the real divide now is, is, is between the social and the liberal, between the communitarian and the individualistic. And I think I'm pretty much on both counts, the Tory party is batting for the individualistic side. And that's the, the problem, and I don't really... I mean, I think Peter Hitchens is right. I mean, there are conservatives, right? There should be a conservative party of some description. Yeah, it's interesting, because there's, well, there's, there's realignment. So obviously because the nature of the economy has changed and, base, and, the, mm. and the class structures have changed and now there are, you know, it's been calculated, there are basically four political groupings yeah. and two of them need to join with two of them to, and, and the obvious alliance is the sort of socially conservative but also quite economically left wing and that's why people thought the Tory party were sort of going to go to because that kind of made political sense and that was the sort of Tom yeah, Cummings, was, yeah, Cummings, I think was probably on top of that a bit, and Gove probably is on top of that a little bit. But the I mean, I, the thing is, you know, I, I'm, I don't, you know, I'm not an economist, and I think you know the, the whole art of economics is basically tea, tea leaf reading, but um, I wouldn't have the confidence to say what would be the economic solution. You know, I have an idea where, for sort of cultural and sentimental reasons, I would like it if our manufacturing base is stronger. I like it if those towns in the north are stronger, and we are more like Germany. But I just don't know. In oh, I don't know how to, whether, well, whether that would work or not. Or that's just me being uh, no, so, so I don't know. Well, we've tried the opposite and it hasn't worked. So I my, know what we have now is is yeah. obviously 9%. not ideal. But you know the so the yeah, so story I've mentioned before is that so during the Brexit debate, by the thing there was this party mm. in the Millbank Tower, and mm. I think Dan Hanan gave the speech, and then Boris gave the big speech, and obviously he was the main draw, and um, and he gave this talk about London been this great financial centre then declining in the late 20th century then like resurrected under Thatcher mm, mm. and he said when Brexit comes it's going to be like that but like more and like the whole global talent's going to come here and this is going to be this, the economic centre of the world and yeah. it's going to be like this but you know much much more and that's just thinking that is exactly like the opposite of what so many Brexit voters want this is going to lead to such disappointment you've such a different vision they want to they, the, they want to put the brakes on the, globalisation a little exactly. bit or to make it or at least I don't know, like protect them a little bit from its worst it was, excesses. It was a search for protection, uh, and, it, and it was a reaction against the model that's been tried. That's the point. So I, don't, I mean, I don't doubt Dan Hannan's sincerity; he believes this stuff. But I would say it's been tried and it's failed. And, and on the mathematics, I was trying to point out it's basic, really. I know people people don't like economics, but if you constantly run massive trade deficits, you just get poorer because you owe more every single year. You have to pay for the imports, 
and you accumulate liabilities and you just slowly get, you get poorer and poorer. And it's been happening for so long and I speak to you know, politicians and you know, think tanks people and they just don't know what's going on. You have to, it's not, and as I've said before, it's not economics, it's actually just accounting. You're just, you're just running these deficits. Right. I and, mean, then, and that'll happen until you start producing a little bit more. Uh, and I, I've made the point, I think the, yeah, I don't, I don't see any hint of the Tory party being able to grasp this. I think reality might bite. I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't put it past in the next 10 years, Britain having a sort of crisis, not you know, identical, but similar to a sort of Argentinian type that, run, yeah, that where, has, where that once middle class people uh, can't get cash out of the machine, they might think, oh, should, perhaps I should have brought a few British goods, you know, actually, we, thought of, we should have thought about this. I mean, I don't know, what, for whatever reason, since 20, 2007, Britain has been getting much, much poorer relative mm. to its, uh, relative to, if you compare to countries like Denmark or yeah. Netherlands, which we should compare ourselves to rather than like Argentina. Yes. But, you know, Argentina was once a rich country. There was it a phrase, my grandmother used to say, as rich as an Argentine. That was, yeah. that was the future. And then just a series of bad governments. Terrible. And, and then the middle class persistent. left and then it just... Never go back. So that could happen. Persistent offender there. Um, anyway, listen. We so the talk, what, I don't want to talk about the story for too long. Right. We've already talked about it too long. So I, I, we were agreed. I think that the sort of new divide really is between conservatives and social conservatives against uh, liberal progressives. That's that's what the divide is. And you then go on to talk about the fact that um, uh, progressives have a vision. They they want equality, racial equity sexual liberation, self-actualization. They know what they want and they believe passionately in it. And you're saying that social conservatives are constantly reacting to these things and don't really have a vision. Is yeah. that right? I mean, people want, the, people want to buy something you know, for the future, yeah. a vision for the future. Um, you know, I think it comes down to the big one is since the 60s, we've had a, you know, this is like a big cultural revolution, a reformation mm. in our whole culture. And mm. there are two sides to this. And social conservatives are, are sort of like the pagans of Rome. They're on the demographic back foot. And I mean, it, it comes down to basically original sin, whether you believe in mm. original sin. And those, that is the big divide. Yeah. And progressivism doesn't believe that. It believes that society, society is responsible yes. for um, all our sort of downs. I mean, and on so many, you know, I think on, the, on a rational level, I mean, I would say it's conservative, but they, you know, have proven to be failures. You know, the, where, where this... Where there has been a lot of social experiments in the six, since the sixties, it's been a you know a complete failure. Yeah. In most cases, I mean, there have obviously been um, there have obviously been things that have been good. I mean, there's no denying there were there were problems in society. I'm not saying the great liberal. No, you, you have to take together. you have to take large parts of what is called the great liberalisation. I agree, but you're sort of getting at something here, which is I think we may as well stay with it, which is um, original sin, uh, perfectibility, blank slate, uh, sort of theory. And um, the odd thing is, I mean, the first point I'd make about that is that a narrative doesn't have to be true to be effective and to take off. Oh. I mean, I would point to, I'm not a believer. I'm a churchgoer, but I'm not a believer. Um, all the religions can't be right because they are self-contradictory, so, uh, mutually contradictory. So um, it, it's nothing to do with whether this progressivism is right. It's taken and it's going and it's moving. I mean, having a little bit of the supernatural is probably quite a benefit. Mm. I mean, I, you know, this is the funniest thing. is 20 years ago when the new atheism uh, kind of movement or conflict, which was sort of the last, mm. kind of burying the final elements of sort of the strength of Christianity. It was this kind of final death. Threat. There was all this, the average new atheist was laughing, oh, the idea of transubstantiation, no, you know, you can turn it into the body of Christ. Now they're saying, you know, now you would get absolutely piled on if you said someone can't change sex, which is literally yeah, act yes. impossible. It is, yes. It's, yeah. it's a belief system. Terrible, like terrible. You cannot change a criminal like that. Yeah. Um, and it, it's such a... Yeah. That is truly revolutionary. And, and again, I, I I'm, mean, I'm like, accused of spending... My preoccupations are housing and transport and economics, really. But you, we're in a... If you lead a, a little political party now, you've got to get involved in these, uh, these debates. And that is such... And the trans thing is such bad inference, it's such bad metaphysics, the categories a, yeah. are so, you're getting philosophy so wrong. If you stripped out what it was about and you did a one on one, a first year Phil essay on the on categories, you'd fail. You, you know, things, you can't change metaphysics of reality by just saying, I just declare it so, I just think it. Yeah. Well, a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> the, the, the Scottish government does. Yeah. Um, I, I find it, I mean, I find it, it's just interesting from a, uh, just a kind of debating points, the sort of logical 
contortions people make for this. Hilarious. Because I, I don't think there's anything particularly... And I don't look down on people for that, because I, no. I do think people need something in their... I think they need some beliefs that aren't sort of entirely rational, well, yeah, as but, a kind of community, almost. Yeah, but here's the paradox. So you say, you mentioned the new atheists, you know, oh. so the aggressive atheists. Um, I think, you know, I, I now think are a little bit immature in some respect. They, they don't... I mean, you know, um, religion is ubiquitous in human societies, and uh, in a way, they don't really understand what's going on. But I mean, a sort of killer argument against against uh, what they're saying in some respects is that actually, a point John Gray makes, uh, which is that the original sin is just a better descriptor of what human activity is than the perfectibility Rousseau side. It's yeah, just a I better mean, description just, of what's going on. Yeah, I mean, you you have you could be a complete atheist and think, um, you know. Weird, original sin is a great yeah. description. Yeah. It's written yeah. into our, our genes. Um, yeah, and I think that when it comes down to it, that's the sort of big thing. But you, there is, yeah. it's very hard for people to sort of step forward and say, you know, I believe in these things. All, all these kind of ideas which have been kind of ridiculed for decades as, as unfashionable, low status, prudish. Mm. Um, sort of beliefs that we have. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and, and you come up with sort of, and, and they sound sanctimonious or sort of moralised, even though. You know, we've become much more sanctimonious as a society, moralising. You know, mm. there's another one of my sort of running themes is that, you know, the sort of revolutionary period of the last 40 years is over, and now mm. this sort of new order has come in. Yes. And, you know, cancellation is just the return to sort of old moral framing. Mm. But I mean, I just think it's, we just have a kind of stupid framework of, we of what is right and wrong. But we, d we don't know how far that's going to go. Yes, it's, to some extent, it's, it could be a vi victory lap. It's when it's when the consequences arrive. Of, of yeah, I mean, of all revolutions have their kind of period of no censorship. I mean, the French Revolution, Russian mm. Revolution, mm. and then um, you know Lenin's wife turns up or whoever mm. it was in the French and just says, "All right, you can't you can't criticize the new regime now." Mm. And you know they end up filling the prisons and even yeah. fuller than before. Yeah, and I think that's uh, the last ten years have been a bit of that. You know, comedians say, "Oh, we can't make jokes," but of course you can't. Like, no, almost no society has ever tolerated that. But then, there's, but then there's a collision, isn't there, with, with as you mentioned, Scotland, which is in the news now, um, with Sturgeon getting into trouble with her. It's, it's, it's very easy, and it's, it's uh, you know, she probably gets brownie points for, for being nice about uh, trans rights. Um, and then something awful happens, which is you get a double rapist in a woman's prison, and the public say, what are you doing? How can this be? So that's the backlash. It's a collision. I want to be. I want to move on to to your your points. And I, I took because you you describe your piece as a sort of personal manifesto of what yeah. what 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 social conservatives should believe. And I, I I could have probably got more, but I've got about fourteen. I just want to run through them really quickly. So what the foot one of the first things you say is that you recognise you've got to recognise there are trade offs between freedom and equality. And it sounds a basic point, but it's true, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's a fundamental. Um tension in all societies mm. because obviously since 1789 they've been those have all been that mm. and solidarity are the three things and the more um f you know freedom means the freedom to fail and mm. the freedom for other people to to do better mm. and but, I, but, but as a social don't you think i mean sort, sort of on the economically left side we concentrate a little bit more and kick against you know appalling inequality economic inequality which is just ramped up i mean people you know it's partly to do with this, what the economy is based on in the UK. Uh, success in financial services or fund management means that you're just off the charts. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you, you, you should be concerned about that as a social conservative, shouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, uh, social conservatives, I mean, there was a study that said that um, people with, uh, I wouldn't want to use the phrase, but authoritarian conservative views um, were amongst the most hostile to inequality because it yeah. goes against the, their fundamental viewpoint. I mean, mm. you don't have to be a socialist or a, even a social democrat to see that inequality in any kind of group is Problem. is quite bad for yeah. just the general um it destroys morale. the branch you're sitting on that's my point yeah, it destroys and your society people are less likely to uh you know just to help you or trust to, to, yeah to trust each other um yeah i mean that was always the, the, you know, the so the scandinavian model is is you know an attractive one i don't again i'm, I'm not sure if it's a society i don't know if it's a society we can actually imitate because it's just different in many ways but maybe in Aberdeenshire or in orkney I mean, something. it's not the yeah, it's yeah. not the, it's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, the, the problem is the tension between freedom and um, and equality is is you know the more you know again there are this the blank slate comes into because mm. some people are just um, are cleverer, more ruthless, and if you have any kind of meritocracy, mm. uh, you have to sort of downsides. As Michael Young, you know, he mm. wrote about this decades yeah. ago, and is you know I actually read his book quite recently, and it was mm. incredibly accurate mm. um, in what he foresaw. Like in some ways, the kind of most 
accurate of the dystopias, just because the, the way that he foresaw that the sort of ruling class would really really feel that they deserved it, and that mm. would be reflected in the way they... That's and they really look, they yeah. really looked down on... And the people who ended up at the bottom had no... Their kind of dignity was completely destroyed by the whole thing, because they were just told, this is... This is all your fault. It's fascinating. Um, the, 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 I, I interviewed uh, Peter Hitchens quite recently about his grammar school book, and, he, and he, a lot of very interesting things came out of it. One of them was that people will tolerate uh, uh, selection uh, by wealth, They're, which is what we do now. You know, leafy suburbs, we, 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 we uh, congregate and herd middle class sharp elbows to get good places at schools it's, yeah, but no, what they won't London tolerate is, is incredible it, yeah and if they yeah it is incredible but and he talks about it like being a shark tank but the the but people won't tolerate people were less likely to tolerate selection by ability they felt what you mean i'm not good enough to go to school this was an awful idea um i think one of the interesting things about this freedom and, and equality trade-off is is on a sort of bigger scale in the society that we are now which is and it's where i'm going to argue perhaps unusually but not really uh, for more uh, tolerance of, of, um, of differences which is in among racial groups so we ha what we have is we have very very racially and culturally diverse societies uh, but when there are disparities and there are disparities everywhere obviously the you know post uh, BLM and George Floyd you know we're in sort of parity mania now if the, you if you see a disparity you, know, you can't have it and the if the disparity yeah. exists, then it must be to do with structural relation, uh, racism. Um, but my point is, is, a, is a more old-fashioned one, which is that a precondition for diverse societies must be uh, a degree of, of civilised toleration, I call it, between different groups. Yeah, I mean, equity is a terrible poisonous idea, and when Labour do actually come into power, that's going to be ramped up a little bit, since it's, it's just basically a guiding principle now of the left in America. And scary. it's insane. Potentially it's scary. It's, um, it's a, yeah. you know, if you look at history, this has had been a very, very poisonous and violent idea. Um, it's behind lots of, um, it's behind many of the successful communist movements were basically motivated by sort of racial hatred as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you look at in Southeast Asia against the Chinese and Russia against the Germans, um, there was or there class was hatred, Cambodia. Terrible yeah, I mean, but this, yeah. you sort of see if you say to people, and if you go back to you know, European history, if you go well back into the medieval periods, um, you know, hostility towards Jews was motivated by their greater wealth. And mm. even in the pogroms of mm. um, 9th century Europe, it's a really, really poisonous idea. It's also one of those ideas where, with any kind of, even the slightest bit of, uh, sort of logic, the people arguing with it, no, it doesn't make sense. Because, you know, in America, there are loads of different ethnic groups which are, who are richer than whites. Who, well, the top who, ten. The top ten is mainly um, minority groups. Yeah, uh, so yeah, in, in America, the, yeah. the you know the whites are pretty much in the middle. In the middle, yeah. So um, yeah. if they're doing it, and if, if you know if the disparity between white and black is due, mm. due to something nefarious, then Nigerian and Ghanaian yeah, immigrants wouldn't be doing quite so yeah, well. Yeah, what it explains yeah. the other is that yeah. it can't be one or the other. You know, it can't yeah. just be white supremacy on one hand and then no, oh, no, they just work harder. So yeah. no, I think so civilized toleration is a is yeah, prerequisite. So yeah, that's the happen. thing. I mean, like. Diversity and equality obviously go together in mm. government parlance, but mm. they're completely. I mean, diversity used to used to mean inequality in the eighth century. You talk about the diversity of human talent. Yes. Because someone's just different. Yeah. Some people, you know. Yeah. yeah. Do well, this it's tolera like that. toleration of differences. I mean, you can get that. You see that a lot in between. Um, I mean, you see it in the trans debate to some extent. But any 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 disparity in any group, any professional group between men and women, is immediately problematic unless it's. Uh, in the favour of females. Yeah, it's, not it's, so much it's all about you know who gets to be on the cross, isn't it? As Tom Holland said, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. all about sort of sacred groups. And if a sacred group is doing well, then that's this not even talked about. Yeah, uh, I mean the ma the male woman thing is, is also because you know it's there's greater male variability, and that, ha that happens pretty much all mammal species. There are all the, you know mm. the, the board is dominated by men, and so is the prison. And if you go to see the homeless people in what? the Strand, they're mostly. Uh, well, I would say yes. So so you, any, it doesn't any, make any sense in any kind of logical. Anyone denying. Um, fundamental differences between the sexes should just go to a prison I agree yeah, yeah just have a look it's funny we've talked about sort of freedom and equality but the other tension is free freedom the trade-off between freedom and security so how paternalistic should a, a social conservative be because I think the, the other point is that it's freedom in a way but you know the idea that we should just you know government should just back off and let anything happen you see this a lot I mean yeah I, I mean I don't really like the term social conservative I have to say I mean I guess you know if the, if the label sticks um, You've got to use I would, just, I, would, I would think a big problem 
a big wider problem, um, which is probably for more than the government, is just sort of general bad advice, bad and life advice. That because um, when you have, you know, I'm not a great believer in the in the free market of ideas and such, in the sense that the best don't necessarily um, come to the fore, and people mm. don't follow the best advice. And so if you have a system where there isn't any kind of moral governance, which would have been you know, traditionally maybe the church or mm. local community mm. leaders mm. in some respect, the most intelligent and most well-connected people will tend to get the best advice just from well, being around. Well, this, this is what we but, often observe, which is that um, you know, so-called liberals, you know, Democrats in the States, whatever, you know, or, or you know, uh, social liberals here, um, preach. You know, they, they preach liberalism, they practice yeah. conservatism they, personally they in their own lives. They preach what they practice, yeah. Exactly, in their own lives. And so, you know, there's... It, well, it's, so we could say, in the 90s, I suppose like the last time there was this big debate about marriage and, you know, out-of-birth wedlocks, and, and that was kind of basically defeated, and conservatives thought... And they thought it was sort of... seems too lame and fussy and, like, made an art kind of thing to complain about. Mm. But it's, it's clearly something that's calculable, you know, that there is a man, marriage bonus, particularly for men, and, and the direction goes both ways. Like men who are more stable and more employable tend to get married because they tend to be more successful. But it goes both ways. There is definitely a, a kind of civilising effect. So it's a big, big boost, not just for the children, but for the men as well. And I know that now this is where you on the left economically are probably, you know, almost certainly right, is that it's much harder now for a working class man to support families. I mean, it's, well, it's, 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 it's almost impossible in Britain. It's, all it's the insane. States. I mean, no. So there, might, is, there, is, there are huge economic reasons, my, but that kind of social gap is definitely increased by your basic, your playbook for life, which the middle class still stick to, but they don't really want to, they don't want to tell. It, whether it's on drugs or bringing their kids up, or anything, they, they preach one thing and they do, you see it all the time. I've, I've sort of given up listening to them and I just watch what they do now. Um, it sort of links into a broader point about how um, paternalistic or what the state should do. I mean, you're, if you're in a political party, you're concerned with what public policy should be, what the, what the, what the state should do. And you can affect certain things, but what you can't do always is, is determine the sort of overall cultural tone. And my, one of my problem is that uh, we talked about, you know, our being a very diverse society, but the centre it's very difficult to find out where it is now, and the, 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 certainly the, the sort of cultural majority has seems to have left the field in terms of trying to set a cultural tone. Yeah, so there there's is, nothing, nothing for people it's to find. It's a long into. tail of internet chaos, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and in that sort of, sort of zone, you have people sort of move in the most. Sort of most anything, but then you're not setting any rules. You're not setting any standards, of, or you don't, you're not even saying what you want, which is crazy. Let's move on to the family because that's a, a huge thing. Um, you say a, a social conservative should belief in the nuclear family as the foundation of society and basically the producer of good outcomes. Now, I would say that uh, all of quantitative social science says that and proves that. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the benefits to men, there are benefits to women, there are benefits to children, obviously, in wider society on every metric. So why is it sort of approaching a hate fact to, like the SDP does, have a policy in favour of the uh, traditional family? Um, I just think the closer you get to people's reproductive systems, the more politics becomes incredibly personal and, and, um, and I suppose offensive to them. If Because, um, you know, there's a, big, there's a big divide down politics between single and married people. Um, single women, t and both America and Britain, tend to be very on the left, single men tend to be more on the right, um, and in a way, the kind of left, the progressive worldview is a kind of single worldview, because it's very because it's very hard to put these things into practice once you have children, mm. um, unless you're incredibly rich, mm. which you know very rich liberals can be. Yeah, about, um, and marriage stability is higher among the rich liberals. Uh, of course, yeah. Mm. Although ironic, I think in, well in the states anyway, the richest fifth, fifth of women don't work. They're, they're like the sort so the rich. Lowest. Well, because you don't really. Why don't would they you? Do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but where was it going? They do work. Yeah. They do work. They just do, do different things. Yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned the paradox. Let's let's dig into this. So you mentioned the paradox that, and it is a paradox. We've had all this economic growth, and on the data, we're theoretically richer. Uh, and we, as a party, harp on about this thing we called four on forty, which is in in the in the sixties, fifties, sixties, seventies, you could su you could support uh, a family of four on forty hours of an industrial wage of an industrial wage, that would yeah. have done the trick. Okay, now on your, on your household spending table, you're perhaps not having so many foreign holidays, you, there are other things you're buying, but you could, that was possible, now it's impossible. And as you say, housing has been taken off the table um, as a route for many people, I think that's utterly unconservative. I, I, 
I'm appalled by the governments that have done it, successful governments, Labour and Tory, none of them have done anything about it. It's anti-family, anti-society and anti-nation ultimately. So I just think you've got to call it out. So, you, so your aim should be that you know, a working man should be able to... Well, it, it's interlinked. I mean, what they've, made, they've made costs so... It, you, it's, it links into the housing theory of right. everything. I mentioned housing because you know, there's been nothing done to increase the supply of housing so it would even match or, or be, be there for people. Basically. Yeah, I mean, the housing, I mean, housing situation is incredibly depressing. Um, but that's a fundamental, that's a basic that all... Um, if you're a social conservative, you should say, well, you know, you, a route to family life should be a basic. Yeah, and our houses are getting smaller and... Um, I mean, the housing situation is a problem in every major, major city now, isn't it? I mean, there is a certain extent... Awesome, Berlin's cheaper, isn't it? I mean, there isn't is a huge waiting list, isn't it, for the... Uh, well, for it the may have changed recently, uh, but the, the affordability, if you look at the affordability metrics and... and right. And, and well, I, I think Munich is very... Yeah. I mean, Munich, where the... But you could hard, hard, wherever you look, Ed, you I can mean, like Dublin's worse. I mean, I'm just saying, can, it's not just the uniquely do, British thing. Hard it's do worse than us. Most, you know, most cities are drawing huge numbers mm. of people in, mm. um, away from small towns. And, mm. uh, yeah, it's very, it's very depressing. I mean, when my... Uh, when my younger daughter had the sort of leaving day for school when she was 11 and all mm. the kids, about 20 or 30 of a year, said, what do you want to do in, a, in 10 years' time? And they all, all but one said, I'm going to have my own flat. And I was just thinking, it's not going to happen. No, no, it's not. <laughs> like, not well, you, you might have a room. <laughs> you might have a room. Yeah. No, I just think it's, I just think it's appalling. And uh, I think we, we need to, we're very statey on that. Our, the SDP's housing policy is probably to the left of what Corbyn was. Uh, on this, because I think it is a crisis, and, and you need muscle. I asked the policy team, well, "How are we going to deal We're with not, it?" Yeah. You, you, we, we, I said, you know, in theory, take anything you want. Which was, we, we've got entities to build the houses. Uh, we've resourced it via taxing planning gain, and, and we have all the powers on the table to acquire the land and do it. And so, you, unless the state gets back in the business of building houses at scale. And the libertarians would always say, well, let's, just, let's get rid of planning rules. You can put, put little huts up everywhere. And that's a fair point, but they don't really mean that. They don't, they, people say that, but they don't really want that. That's, not, that's, that's in the corner I of the table. I think there is it's scope for, um, you know, I don't know. If we're going to do a policy that's expanding the most uh, expensive, if an area becomes, if the ratio becomes so big, then the, clearly the town has to expand, and it's been artificially constrained. I mean, I think that Britain has quite a lot of social housing compared to most countries. I mean, I don't think... I would definitely be more in the favour of um, allowing private developers more. So oh, yeah, no, you, I, I think... I mean, I mean there's I'm obviously not, you still make a profit from house, but they're not, not being constrained. I'm but. not, but it's, what I'm saying it is it's the missing... I get very frustrated on this issue. I'm partly because I'm a... You know, started my career at Westminster in planning, and, and I'm a, a town planner by trade, and yeah. I, did, I built some houses, know a little bit about it, and, and I, I'm frustrated because... There's this thing that, because we're so marinated in all this, uh, you know, sort of right-wing uh, economics, um, government shouldn't and c shouldn't and couldn't do anything about it. Um, the big thing that's been deliberately taken off the table and destroyed, which is state sector capacity, yeah. you doesn't even think about it. I mean, think, oh, 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 well, actually, the state used to outbuild the private sector, but now it doesn't. Oh, let's not talk about that. Let's let's think about planning rules or zoning, and they just can't face Isn't that up to because the fact. I would say um, the stuff, the state bill after the war, probably a lot of it was quite poor quality compared to like the thirties. Doesn't have to be now. You go to no, no, I'm just saying that's what pay, that's sorry, I'm just kicking you there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but also um, the the social housing system is also quite uh, dysfunctional in, in many ways, in that the ch it's changed from something that was inherited and. Yeah. Passed on through good character to. And it can be, well, and it should be. I mean, that, I, would, also, that would also upset that. quite a few people because that would also be I, I know, quite but conservative. You, I know it is. Um, I'm afraid it is quite conservative. I think if I, people if people were shown, oh, this you'll have a sort of this would be like a Vienna style, lovely sort of you know pretty social housing block where people behave themselves. I think people would probably buy that, but. I think maybe for various historical reasons in England it's got a sort of reputation as being... It is, but um, you can't, but what my, my point is a really broad one, which is you just can't destroy the whole sector and say it doesn't matter. That's, uh, anyway... I mean, I agree, the uh, housing is the biggest, you know, it's the biggest problem in the sense that you've got people spending 50 or 60 percent of their income on housing, that's insane. I mean, that's, that's we, literally what happened in the Russia, Russia the before anti, the revolution. The anti-natalist thing, the anti-family thing, again, upsets me because, you know, the libertarian conservatives and the Tory party is full of these people that don't really care about it. And they, they're, they're literally saying, you've got conspiracy theorists on one side saying replacement of population, and then you've got, then you've got others saying, 
who are the Tories saying, well, it doesn't matter, really. Just let's just let's just ramp up immigration anyway. So it doesn't matter if you've got replacement level. Yeah, I uh, think it that, 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 that's, that's, that is definitely seen as a solution. I mean, oh, so it is the solution because then I, mean, it's, I mean, I I'd say it's a Ponzi scheme. And can't, it's, it is a Ponzi um, scheme, like so many others. You know, immigrants like the rest of us age, so you can't yeah. really use it. No, I mean, that's, that's another sort of, sort of social, long-term, short-term thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, I think I mentioned it, didn't I? posterity. It's a sort of big thing, and I don't think we really talk about the concept. You know, what we want our great grandchildren to look back on us. Do they, you know, did they build something for us? Did they leave something behind? Did they and plant then, trees? There's nothing, you know, that's is much more important than, no. you know, the currents of GDP. I so. agree. No, that, that, that's just the gold displacement. They've just, they don't even think about that. Let's move on. So you've okay. got, you've got, um, uh, you say conservatism in my mind means creating a society that is most pleasant for the average man. And what, I've t what I want to take, because I'm trying to make you into a, a, a social democrat, really. <laughs> uh, what I want to do with that is to say, well, that's three cheers, because you are in good company, because Clement Attlee and certainly Ernie Bevin thought the same way. Both of their biographers, particularly Bevin, uh, his biographer says, he, you know, Bevin had a majority, what he described as a majority mind. What they were, tr what, what trad labour used to do right. was look after most old of new labourers. Yeah, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah, real, real labour. Trad labour. Yeah. It's more like us. That's what we. I mean, I've, you know, I think that's if you want that sort of thing, you should look at us. But the, but that's what they. They had a majority mind. They were, they, they weren't constantly preoccupied, obsessed with, with minority rights. They were trying to do what you, you say, the average man. Is that fair? Have I got you right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much me. That's if a I tip. wrote it, it must be true. A <laughs> it must be that. true. It must be true. Okay. I always say I'm an athlete, though. But no, I mean uh, that is a sort of no. But you, well, maybe you haven't. Maybe you, uh, you should have twigged. But that's the that's the way. You, that's you see what happened with Labour is that they the first time they did this rainbow coalition of minority, mutually antagonistic, but yeah. minority interest was eighty three. Um, underfoot, and Peter Shaw, who's, who's my overall political hero, after that disastrous election, said you've just completely misunderstood what the left should be doing. We we bring up, we get a large coalition of the whole yeah. country. The moderate, you know, it'll come with us. You're bringing people together, and we, you know, you're not focusing on. That. That's my particular preoccupation, and that's mine. And, yeah, and Mark that's, Liller makes the point in the, in the states a lot about. He describes it as being a sort of like hammering in sort of little niches for each group. And yeah. The Democrat platform is mentions every single group and never says. I don't think it actually says like Americans. Like just no, it's um, just us. Just yeah, us. It's just every single. No. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. It's a very important point. I mean, the, I guess that the I mean, the the analogy I've made before is that the political debate is really between the sort of the typical and the atypical. Mm. You know, the, the Harry Potter analogy, everyone, a lot of people identify with wizards because they want to sort of special. And, mm. and a lot of thought of the expanding identity thing, which is kind of attached to sexual identity, even though in most cases it doesn't seem to actually match their own sexual preferences. It's kind no. of just the sort of... Well, that's a curious thing. I mean, it's hilarious data on this from the States. I mean, uh, you know, where, where young people's um, minority sexual preference will be up here and then practice will be down here. Yeah, so because they're, they're all on their phones anyway. <laughs> but right. I mean, they're not <laughs> on their phones, um, I haven't got time. Yeah, I, I think yeah. a lot of that is just the, the quest to be atypical because a lot of people yes. don't want to be average. So when I talk about, I suppose it's a kind of a standard, a quite a common um, you know, fra phrase people say is, you know, if you want to judge society, you know, to see how it treats its prisoners. And I always thought, well, no, just treat, judge how it treats the average person mm. Who kind of is not the mode? Yeah, yeah, it's not hugely talented, not mm. very special, but can he or she afford a family totally and live yeah. in peace and have a decent life and have health care and those kind of things? That's it. And that to me, that's like a much better stance. Uh, no, totally and so I think of something like the Scan, you know, the Scandinavian countries. That's yeah. that's not bad, is it? No. Well, no then, so then you know, the contrast is the United States, which is you know much richer than us. And we're kind of hanging on its coattails in so many ways as well because of you know technological development and medical development. We they sort of do all the, but you know no one even its greatest patriots would sort of claim that it's a good place now if you're poor or if you're not particularly. Um, not you know, yeah, no, I agree. Things. I agree. So, my, so my, you know, the pitfalls there. My, my wife's Australian, uh, and they've they've got when when she came here, 
she was quite shocked at the inequality in London. That was sort of 30 years ago. And she said it's much easier to be slightly poor in Sydney than it was. Right, uh, okay. But that's not, actually, Sydney's got a bit that's worse. That's probably changed, I think. Sydney's yeah, it's got, got quite worse. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not. But, they, but it's, it is true that 80, what, what people call the average Australians, which are 80% of the society, there's uh, much more inequality in that block. So they, they have achieved it. Let's move on. So you've got, um, you say, we believe in freedom of speech but needlessly offending people is not to be celebrated. I, I agree with you. I, I think, I, I think um, it is an important thing. We'll, I want to go on to freedom of association mm -hmm. because you say that's even more important, don't you? Yeah, I think it's much more important. Why? Because uh, it's, you know, Christopher Caldwell in his book on America, he described it as the, the master freedom. He says once, once you lose the freedom of association, which Americans start doing because of civil rights laws, mm. um, then all the other kind of freedoms starts Fall apart. Away. You know, yeah. we're in a, a club here, which is, I've, I would say, sort of typical of the sort of the British mm. liberal model as it grew mm. up in the 18th century, mm. um, you know, which is a club system. And that's mm. where people were free mm. to do whatever they mm. want without anyone sort of telling them what to do. Mm. And, and authoritarian regimes in mm. Louis XIV France, mm. they hated these clubs, they shut them down. They were, yeah. they were conspiracies. And, and I think the, the Freedom Association rubs up against the idea of equity and inequality because they're inevitably going to be... I mean, you know, there's... One of the big things now is, is you know, it's, it's kind of funny, this kind of trans um, debate about prisoners, but, you know, 15, 20 years ago, um, there was a sort of big campaign of shutting down all male clubs, all male societies. I mm. think that's like a, that was a very illiberal and, Desperately bad illiberal. and a very mm. negative thing. I think it's quite important for people to have kind of private institutions, yeah, private the, clubs or, where they or, can or the Women's together. Institute. Yeah, whatever, I just think, and, and there are some which are single sex, and that's absolutely fine. Yeah. And that's a place, and it's a good place where people, can, kind of men, can learn to sort of be men, to behave mm. themselves. And um, but on just, I mean, I, t I totally agree with you on that. I think, but on the on the freedom of speech point, um, you know, it's, it's a touchstone now. Um, I think, I mean, you, you, we're very pro free speech, and I think it's a major problem on campuses and the academy generally. A lot of students are, are fairly cowed, particularly the socially conservative ones, even if they're majority in the room they don't feel they can speak and so yeah there, I, there are always consequences aren't there major yeah. problem but it, but it, if you look at it on a sort of very broad spectrum you know a historical view they never really ha i mean free speech of the kind of the sort of without any consequences speech no uh, there has there's always been blasphemy laws of some sort and i just think the removal of blasphemy laws has just been replaced by Others. We've got the fact, though, blasphemy laws. Those people often, are, you know, people have gone to jail for sharing jokes about George Floyd, which is just outrageous. Well, the, the I mean, school, it's just absurd. The school teacher in Battley is, is that's not, not a school. That's a, that's a de facto blasphemy. Yeah, that's law. A, I mean, so there's, there's two blasphemy laws. There's the sort of hate speech ones, and then there's the, the threat of death. I yeah. mean, on the, you know, Islam is kind of an exception in that it's the only religion where um, there's a sort of menace to the to the sense of enforcement, which, you know, as an Englishman, makes me think, well, then that's. Mm. The, the, the right to insult people should be more important. Should be there. Um, yeah. I just gen generally, I don't think people should be insulting or like mocking people's religions. Generally, no. I don't think TV should carry no, that sort of stuff. If no, it, not gratuitous. Unless it's absolutely not gratuitously. Yeah. I agree with you. There on must that. be. A, there is a point where something is artistically, you know, valuable enough, then that's fine. But that has to be, yeah, like, very, very delicately. But it's a bit. No, I agree. I take the point about civility totally. I totally agree with you. But. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think there's, there's nothing new happening here as usual. There's nothing new happening. Uh, my favourite ancient philosopher is Epicurus, and he, he, he uh, in the third century, he gave a, a talk when he's quite young. He's about 20 years old in Colophon, uh, and doubted the existence of the gods. There was a riot, and he was nearly killed. And um, funny when he got when he set up his school in Athens, he didn't, didn't say that. He, what right. he said was that the yes the gods exist but they don't do anything so he took any so he got a formulation which no i've no doubt at all he didn't change his view but he worked out a formulation which enabled him to practice yeah. philosophy in, in athens um and sometimes it has to be like that whatever whatever you think right the next thing you say which i totally agree with actually we'd have to find something we've argued <laughs> a little bit about but anyway uh, cities need to be civilized that's public realm isn't it the quality you need to care about the public realm yeah um, so this is about you know the crime. Now, it's, crime is, I mean, crime in Britain is not actually hugely increasing. It's it's, it's on a downward trend. Um, from obviously, if you if you look historically, it was very low uh, until about the 1960s, and it started rising rapidly. And in the 90s, it reached its peak. Since mm. then, it's been slightly going downwards. I mean, the no mid 90s mm. and late 90s is the peak. Um, partly just there's so much more technology now. Partly. Um, 
in terms of you know everyone's got a camera mm. so um, there's also much better medical treatment and there's also we're just an aging society as well yes. and, and all the kids I are at home on their phones so yeah, um, a, lot of, a lot of the kind of crime element of that has kind of basically been solved in a kind of bad way mm. it's, it's, it's sort of mm. It's kind of like a decadence, but like a worse decadence. Yeah, because the kids aren't out fighting and, and having yeah. unprotected sex; they're just at home. Because they're too too screen banned. Yeah, they're all to do that. Too, yeah. too, too fat I was to more. Any, to I, was, anyone. I, I was partly thinking about because I'm trying to make a sort of a bit of a sort of public realm statey lefty point here, really on on public realm on 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 our duty to to look after it and and for government to do that or at any, at any level whether it's in my village or a town or yeah. civic what I'm talking about is sort of Ian Nan type sort of civic pride thing which I mean it's not just you know broken windows theory about vandalism and graffiti I, uh, we know about that but I'm talking about too too many of our towns and cities you go and think you know it smells of skunk and there's you know begging yeah, everywhere there's begging skunk everywhere we, we've yeah. got a we've got a policy uh, in the you know in the SDP's policy set about you know um, uh, you know, s something being done about public vagrancy because I think, I think it's very antisocial. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's um, yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. I mean, what I find you know, Britain is you know, it's an anarcho tyranny is the you know the phrase is. If you go around, not far from here, from the, you can go in the Home Office and there are people outside that are taking heroin, but literally around the corner. So yeah, that, is, that you can't That's allow that to happen. That's no, a you real can't. message to. No, you can't. Uh, and just stuff like if you take the tube, the constant, this constant harassment by beggars. Um, I mean, I think it is possible to have a kind of combined, you know, the Finns had a, a huge sort of house building policy mm. to, to remove homelessness. And, mm. and you, know, the, you know, there are seems there are sort of three or four big factors. One of them is just the cuts to social services. One of them is uh, the cost of housing. Another one is family breakdown. Another is drugs. Those are the, and the sort of the reduction in mm. um, number but of medical the beds for mental illness, which have been also But I think it's an even reduced. bigger cause. I think, because I say this a lot, I think the, I think the bigger cause is not wanting to. So I think you, oh, I don't take away all, any of the points you've yeah. made there. I think that's true. But I think it's like the migrant crisis. You know, people say, well, why don't they solve it? It's because they don't want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's no, actually why. Yeah. Honestly, that's why. Some but of them want to and they think it's, that wouldn't be a good look because they don't want to be the baddies. Some of them just generally don't care. Dinner parties. Um, but there's, there's, yeah, it doesn't people, affect us. I mean, there, there are people in the you know, Ministry of Justice who don't believe in prison, who say it's an outdated. You know, they we, do exist. We know. There's people dinner parties in London. We know. No, it doesn't. Is, yeah, no, it's exactly. Bad. Like, um, no, I mean the vagrancy thing is is kind of is really depressing. Um, but they don't and it care just, it makes, Yeah, it just makes. I mean, I think outside London, there's a there's a bigger problem, which is a lot. I think the civic leadership have basically left in a lot of towns. Not a huge, but but there has been, which is the kind of selection effect. Um, you, you could say, and, it's and that's 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 the problem where there are sometimes you just think people don't. No one really cares anymore anymore. No one's kind of running the place. But that, um, but can I just get on that? Because you, I think you, I think you've nailed it just there. No one's running the place, and I think one of the reasons is the structure of local government. I mean, if you've worked in it, I've worked in it as an officer and a, a member for probably twenty years combined, mainly in the private sector. But you know, reason my own experience, and I think I think local government in the UK is run like a, it's a it's a subcontractor for national policy. Right. And if you go to a French town, the mayor. It's going to have quite a lot of power. Yeah, yeah. I they, mean, the mayor, they, you, the mayor, it's on the mayor. The local basically. prefect turns up yes. and he's sort of Napoleon like sash. And he's exactly. Got the, and why not? You know, yeah. as um, as a as a civil. But they don't drum as they're spending, though, did they? So it's mostly basically. And then when they have the, you know, the scope to do to, to do things, that's the point. They have the actual. Never mean in Britain they don't have much power. Compared no, to the, yeah. very little power, and and it's very and a lot of the power is very fettered. And it's not just resources; it's actually you know you can't. I mean, uh, uh, in in a lot of countries, the mayor decides, right, we're going to do this in the marketplace, we're going to do this, and I'll speak to the police, and we'll do this. Right. But now it's no, it's you know you, you you've got some national ordinance. It's all very fettered. It's very right. very controlled. So, yeah, it's partly a, a sort of structural thing there. Um, let's move on. You you say uh, wealth can, wealth creation is best achieved through high levels of market freedom, and. I generally agree with you, but it's qualified because I think, I think. Um, I, I think only did A level economics, I should say. This is why I don't have the confidence to go further onto that. Are you That's just my, my general impression. It's your general but thing. Okay, well, I, well, I would say if I was going to, we're going to have a great big discussion about it. I would say the questions I've noted down here is: Don't markets have a social function? I mean, I think they do. The state, you know, society grants things like limited liability and structures. It's not to say that it doesn't. It, it, 
it's, it's the point that a lot of you know, left-wing Labour people used to make, which is that corporate interests, and you must agree with this, corporate right. interests do not map or align no, themselves with interest. society. No, they do have the, it's self-interest and yeah. short term. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the sort of details thing, though, isn't it? I mean, that's... Yeah. M- most countries which are wealthy do tend to have quite a lot of market freedom. Yeah, no, even, I, the, even the, sort of the ones that then redistribute. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think my only point, I mean, I would say, and again, it's one of these slightly counterintuitive things which people hear, people in the SDP say, do you think that? Yeah, of course, I mean, I would say we're more, we're as pro-market as any party in the UK, easily. For general goods and services, the market's far more efficient at providing them and distributing them and making them and so on. Trade, natural trade, you know, normal mass of trade should be left to the market. But my, my gripe is that the, the, uh, the frontier between what the state does and the market should do was distorted uh, in the Thatcher era and hasn't recovered. So the ba- a lot of the basic stuff like you know, utilities, uh, railways, housing, and the, usually the things I complain about, yeah. which I see as on the, on, the, on the state side of the frontier, should be, or not all of it, but some of it should be, uh, have been, you've, got, you've got the market being deliberately put into it. And I think, so you end up, what do, how do we end up? Well, we end up with Thames Water instead of its prime function being to provide water to the citizens of London, its main function now is to siphon off revenue to foreign owners. <laughs> I, that's, that's just a The water companies don't seem terrible. to be doing a great job. I mean, it's terrible. I'm not an expert in the area. <laughs> no, no. Well, a couple well, of people, in, when that piece came out, a few people replied, yeah, that sounds like you're a German Christian Democrat. And I wonder, do people call you that? Is that? Uh, well, the, the actually, some of the yeah, some yeah, actually interesting. The social market model that we follow yeah. in the SDP still follow it. So I always think, you know, I mean, I joined the party in, in eighty two. Dad was a founding member in eighty one. You know, there's lots of things we still we still believe in. I mean, there's been a little bit of a turn here and there. We've actually become more socially conservative and less radical, I think. But is that maybe just because the, the rest older. of the world has changed? I don't know, I, but no, but but the social market theory yeah. stuff is just very, very good. It's just, I mean, and I would argue that the, you know, if you get a career or you get a successful industrial economies like Singapore, that's the social market you're seeing there. You're not seeing, you're not seeing corrupt parties selling off bits and chopping them up. No, the, the parts of the statey bits are just run very efficiently. And I've never argued for a big state. It has to be strong, and it has to know what it's doing. But. Um, you know, anyway, so that's, that's I, think, I think you're persuadable on that. Um, now, uh, this is a big one. This is quite controversial. You say, um, this is talking about society in general, the broader uh, picture. S- diversity is not a strength. Why? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I've written a whole book on this, but... Uh, you have? Ten I've, years I've ago, read it. I've changed read it. today's world. Yeah. Um, no, um, just the, look at the overwhelming evidence in the social sciences is a negative relationship between diversity and trust. Um, what probably does benefit certainly the economy and, and elements of a society is having a sort of open, um, having an open society that's, that's free. Mm. Uh, and those kind of liberal societies do tend to become more diverse because they can tend to go with more liberal immigration policy. But it's not the direction it comes from. Mm. Um, you know, liberalism and, you know, the our sort of economic system developed in quite homogenous places. Mm. They didn't develop in empires because empires were too kind of hamstrung by rival ethnicities mm. and, you know, democracy. Democracy and diversity are very hard to square. They, if one, if the most powerful, you know, if the largest group falls to a certain point, percentage point, then you start to become in, you, you see standing in the centre. Yeah, and then voting mm. just starts becoming along, along ethnic lines. I mean, the, the states, um, you know, the among the sort of 14 reasons for sort of uh, polarization that have been added up and you know the increased diversity of the country is obviously a factor in it. I mean that's if the major group goes from being 90 percent to sort of just over 60 percent mm. one party is going to start becoming dominated by that group and people who tend to identify with that group even if they're not from it so it's not mm. like a, mm. a completely diversity is not the entire story in that in sort of yeah in those bits, but it's a big factor and if you just look at um you know, there is a, a tendency most amongst liberals and conservatives to move away from diverse areas. I mean, if you, as, as, as a policy, if your citizens independently move away from, from the policy which you've made your national policy, then that is a problem. Um, because they are sort of, you know, voting with their feet. You're making, this, mm. you're making your society something that they, they want to live in less. 
Yeah, um, and also, you, I mean, in, in, in many British cities, you've got you know, very, very large, unassimil relatively unassimilated groups, and people talk about parallel societies. I mean, the, to pick up on the point you made earlier about social trust, um, I mean, it was, it was Put Robert Putnam, wasn't it, in his book? He, yeah. he wrote the book and he had the data first. He didn't want to publish it because as a liberal uh, social science academic... Yeah, he spent, he's wasted five years for the study to... Yeah, because it, was, it, was sort of, it became a bit of a, a problem. I, I think it's... I mean, if you want to... I, I, and it, it, you, you, you talk about um, David Goodhart's uh, prospect piece, you know, um, too, yeah, that's too, big too, too yeah. diverse. Yeah. yeah. So I think basing on, basing on a basic principle, I mean, you've got to have some sort of core... Uh, social values, culture in, in a uh, society. And we've argued for uh, a, a mass, what we call a mass immigration pause, probably quite a long one would be a good idea. I think that would be For, a, for good faith, yeah. genuine good faith reasons to get to know each other a little bit. And, and I think it would have good outcomes. Uh, I found it surprisingly hard uh, to, to, to argue for it. You get cut down quite quickly if you argue for it, but I think Actually, a lot of people would see the sense of it on any side. I think it's you know, it is a sacred value and it's a sacred argument. Um, and as long as you accept the taboo, then you can't mm. argue against it. And I just think you, uh, politicians need to be courageous and say, no, I think this is wrong. Um, this is a bad idea. And I know we've, we've been completely sort of imbued with this idea of diversity being a sort of sacred you know, value that makes us more morally mm. superior. Um, but just look at the evidence that, you know, what, mm. and, and the biggest problem as well is that when, if you have unstable demographics, yeah. you are inevitably going to get unstable politics. Our, our, our country is continuing to change in such a, such a rapid way, you know, speeded up by the Conservative Party, which is yeah. the kind of bitterest pill because the Conservatives underlying the whole, the, the sort of, I suppose, both Brexit and their victory against Corbyn. Mm was an understanding but we you know we want to slow this down you know we don't we don't mind change they but we don't, but they don't and they just they, and they really can care it was like no. literally so what i mean no but that's why that's why i mean I, we, we haven't you know we've gone over the tory party in this interview but to go back to they're it still living rent free and they're, they're, they're hovering around yeah. but the reason they'll probably get absolutely destroyed in the next election is that the public i mean i think it's, it's actually wrong what they've done as a project is wrong which is they come to elections they say a little bit family values a bit and about reducing immigration and a bit uh, and they convene the votes, and people vote for them in good faith, right? Yeah. Well, and then did. they and then they just completely let them down, and I just think this time they're gonna, you know, they'll just be hammered for it. Uh, and, well, and, I hope and so because right. I think it'll be just, um, and they'll be punished. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, it's not just. I mean, because Brexit was obviously a huge uh, palaver, and immigration was a major factor. And after all that, after all the inconvenience and hassle. And then you actually massively increase it. Yes. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's almost unbelievable. It's so insane. What, what, is, what is the, the logic behind this? No, it's, it's, they, they have no idea what they're doing. They're, it's a completely different interview, but the, 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 the reason they're in such difficulty uh, over Brexit, I always have to remind people that they, the Tory party's policy was against Brexit. I mean, they, they, it was never the Tory party's policy to leave the yeah. EU, so they didn't actually want it. Out of all the, uh, it's one of these situations where the uh, views in the country did not remotely reflect the, the opinions of parliamentarians. Uh, there was only one party that wanted Brexit, which was the DUP, <laughs> actually. So the, 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 they didn't want it, and then they convened an unstable coalition, and Boris Johnson sort of bluffed his way through, uh, and it was in flat denial over things like the protocol, and it all burns up because they and their best idea was unilateral free trade, which is utterly insane and crazy. So uh, it's hardly surprising. Um, right. Yeah, they didn't have a plan. They didn't want it. And, <laughs> you know, they were pushed into it by by UKIP, and UKIP was was motivated by immigration more than than you know feelings against the EU. Those two things became kind of. T I mean, obviously the EU did entail but, free movement, but it was also against just general increased immigration on the Blair. And but but as, and I take the immigration point, but even on on the economics, uh, we get back to the economics because even UKIP for most of its time, Paddy, Patrick O'Flynn was, was on our side, but you know, he was in a party you know, run by Farage. Most, most UKIP people were, were uh, free trade libertarians. So yeah, they, it started off as a kind of Thatcherite right, kind of... Yeah, they didn't. Movement. So the, the only... I mean, I'm a little bit frustrated because the only coherent, sensible, slightly protectionist, paternalistic model was the, was the Peter Shaw model, which is any, is any Brexit model makes any sense, the Lexit one. I think it? the Peter Shaw sort of vision is would seem very ancient history to a lot of people. That that kind of well, element. But it, yeah, but it's the only it's anything that makes any sense. You I know, no, I'm just you saying. Can't do it, it's that, you that can't actually do it any other way. I, I think there was a base because, you know, Brexit, whatever it was, if it was a mistake or not, 
there was this basic, uh, I think there was just a basic lie in the sense of society that people were being told. So, you know, working class English people were saying, oh, when the, the, the rising number of uh, migrants is putting our wages down. And the, the, the entire, this is why I don't really have much respect for economists. The entire profession say, no, that's not true because here supply and demand doesn't actually apply. It's actually, it's more, you know, complicated than that. And there are other factors. And I think that, that was obviously true. Like, of, obviously, obviously, if you true. flood the, flood the well, market, they were losing out. So, and so even if they did end up by voting for Brexit, actually really damaging the economy and the country, Farmer just thinks, well, I mean, what do you expect? The social contract was basically broken by trying to, by, I wouldn't say you were replaced, I might get in trouble. But that's what basically is, if you're getting new workers into Yeah, the job, yeah, so. they didn't care. It's, it, I, workers I are just, eight, just econ units. We're totally indifferent about it. We have no, we're, we're completely indifferent about culture or cultural sovereignty. We couldn't give a monkey about that. We don't, we're not bothered. That's how they think, and, and these are the consequences. I take your point on, on the supply and demand curves, unless, yes. unless there's something very weird happening. I mean, I um, think obviously over the long term you might have different effects, but um, the general you know, rule is that if you in increase the supply of something, it's going to go down. And it's the same with Labour. And I think there was a genuine um, lack of betrayal of society. And the Tories, if they now n don't understand that, then they will. They don't, the I'm afraid. They I, don't. I don't think they no, they don't. Uh, I have no faith in that. The sort of penultimate thing I want to just uh, touch on briefly uh, is education. You say education is a wonderful thing, but overextension of higher education has a negative impact. Yeah. Well, just too many people go to universities. I mean, I'm, I'm quite radical in education. It's probably my most libertarian view is that I think. Mm. No, I think people should, like the sort of 50% aim for universities mad. Um, it should be somewhere between like 15 and 25, I imagine. I mean, mm. people should get training. Mm. I mean, I also think people should be able to leave school at 14. I'm pretty quite crankish about this. Mm. I mean, my eldest is now 14, I think, you know. If you want to You're there. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think people should be able to, uh, I mean, this is a very German thing. To, to go much more into uh, learning trades from an early age, from about fourteen, and then they can um, then they can spend half the time in school. I agree. Um, I agree. I think I think I take all those points I, on training and, and skills training. It's obvious to me. I think a lot but of teenagers want to earn money, and that's completely reasonable. Yeah. I mean, and and the, and the, and they'd rather earn money than learn subjects where they really get not very good at and they're not really learning and they're kind of making the teachers' lives misery. But you talk about so, a Ponzi scheme, Ed. The the other thing is that just on economics again. You're allocating resources for something you're not getting a positive return from. Yeah. So the, th the three, you know, basic uh, income streams for universities, two of them are based on debt entirely. You know, government spending, which is in debt, and uh, you know, student debt, which, which you know, by 2050 will be 450 billion, and it'll be crazy never pay, paid back. It's just massive misallocation yeah. of resources. Apart from all the points, the cultural points of elite overproduction that Michael Lind, the people like that, mention, and so I, I totally agree. Um, I want, the final thing I want to ask you is, because you, you, often you read, I love your blog, and I, I, a lot of us do, and uh, you read it and it can seem Thank a little you. bit bleak, but, 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 it's, it's better to know what the facts are, you, you know, I don't want to live in a fool's paradise, and uh, so I want to finally ask you, what are the consolations of being a social conservative? Um, well, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Can we, don't, I just we don't seem like a very happy bunch no, from the outside. I mean, I... I don't know. I mean, I would ra I'd rather, I mean, would I actually, I would think I probably would prefer to be a liberal and happy and say this is all fine, but rather I mean, than kind of worry about, you know, where this is going. What I was but getting at, well, if I might be prompting you here, but what I was getting at is if you, isn't it better to live in a, a world which is a higher correspondence of reality than, uh, than a t complete fantasy world? I mean, you know, actually, you can argue that religious people are happier and so on. I, could get, I can see that, but the certain traits in social conservative practice, you know, saving before you buy something, you know, stable marriage, commitment, duty, and sort of what you, you, you touch on it as sort of hobbit behaviour, you know, those things actually do produce proper yields, don't they? In life, in real yeah, life. I mean, yeah, I mean, but are, are, are people who believe in social conservatism like that more than social liberals? I'm not entirely sure. I mean, amongst the journalist profession, obviously not. <laughs> um, I, I think a lot of people who identify as liberal or centrist are, are, you know, very, very conservative in the way they. And in, once upon a time, they would have been Tories, um, yes. but they, you know, it's, it's, they don't sort of preach what they practice. Yeah, they, they yeah maybe to, you're right. They tend to actually. I mean, yeah. uh, certainly. I mean, in the states, so I just come back to the states because I just got better data on this. You know, people mm. who Democrats who have families tend to save much longer. They have families much later. Mm. It's kind of conservative voters who have them when they're. I mean, most people are having kids now in the sort of late 30s, mm. 40s, because mm. they're saving mm. for so long to save. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and people almost, 
I think almost over conscientious in mm. in the way we behave sometimes. Yeah, maybe you're um, right. Maybe you're right. I'm, I I still think you're better off knowing what what's what. And I think you do. It's the truth. It's the tr- what I call the truthometer being quite high on some of the things you're writing, and I think that's Thank well you. worth it. So, Thank you very much. listen. Thanks very much. The uh, I'll put the uh, link to Ed's blog on the. Um, on the link to this interview and thanks very much. Thanks, a pleasure. Cheers.